was a professional burglar who was extremely proud of the fact that over all these years of robbing houses, he had never been caught. Only moments after prying open a particular window and stepping into a very dark bedroom, this burglar came for the very first time face to face with a vicious looking Doberman Pinscher. The burglar froze in his tracks and he needed to allow time for his eyes to adapt to the darkness in the room. And as his eyes did, he noticed that on the back of the dog there sat a parrot. It squawked, you're going to get caught. And the burglar hesitated, then ever so carefully he reached up and he took one item off of the dresser in that bedroom and slid it into his sack. The dog watched every move intently. The parrot simply said, you're going to get caught. And without any sudden or jerky movements, the burglar then cleared off the rest of that dresser top. And the dog glared, and the parrot said, you're going to get caught. The burglar quietly left the room. He headed down the hallway to another room, and the dog followed every movement in the hall to that next room. And the parrot squawked, you're going to get caught. This was beginning to drive the burglar crazy. From room to room, the dog paced right behind the burglar while the parrot annoyingly shouted, you're going to get caught, you're going to get caught. At last, the burglar finished stealing the jewelry and the cash in the very last bedroom, the master bedroom. The very last thing he took was from the safe in the master bedroom closet. As he finished doing this, every move by every muscle was scrutinized by the Doberman Pinscher. And the parrot once again said, you're going to get caught. And that drove the burglar crazy. He reached down, he picked up a shoe, and he threw it at that parrot. And he said, I am so fed up with you saying that, you dumb parrot. Can't you say anything else? And the parrot fluttered away to avoid the shoe and then said, sick him. <laughs> the burglar's day of judgment was at hand. And our gospel lesson looks back to another day of judgment when the Son of Man comes in his glory. Now can you picture this parable that Bill and I just read to you in your mind's eye? I love how the great preacher Spurgeon described this event in one of his sermons. I can't give you the entire description. It was too long, but let me give you a portion. Suddenly a voice is heard, shrieks from some, songs from others. He comes, he comes, he comes, and every eye must see him. There he is. The throne is set upon a cloud which is white as alabaster, and there he sits, it is he, the man that died on Calvary. I see his pierced hands, but ah, how changed. No thorn crown now. He stood at Pilate's bar, but now the whole earth must stand at his bar. But listen, the trumpet sounds again. The judge opens the book. There is silence in heaven, a solemn silence. The universe is still. Wow, I mean, Spurgeon was awesome. I, I can't do anything like that. But this parable seems to suggest, and as Spurgeon pictures for us so beautifully, that time is coming when everyone, and that means you and me, everyone will be judged by God. Christ is separating, you see in this parable, this great crowd into two groups, and on his right side, we have the group that's called the sheep. And in the parable itself, it describes the sheep as the righteous. And on his left, he's got the goats. You know, there is no other title really given for the goats. So I guess, in contrast, I would suggest that they are the unrighteous or the cursed. And to the sheep, Jesus says, come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And they will enter the heavenly kingdom. Now the goats, you know, they're not so fortunate. You that are accursed, says Christ, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So I ask you, 
Which line are you in? Which group are you in? Do you know? Are you sure? How would you reason it? Why or why not? I know it's not politically correct to suggest that a day of judgment is coming, but I'm sorry, I put my trust in God's word, not in the political correctness. I put my trust in the living word, Jesus Christ, who told this parable. I put my trust in the written word, the holy scriptures, where it's found. A day of judgment is coming, and many of us think, we know which of the two groups we're in, or we hope we, we know, we're a sheep. But as we consider the parable, I, I want you to note the surprise element. Did you find it as we read it? It's wrapped up in the word when. I want you to give that word some tonal inflection as you read this parable. And then I want you to notice how surprised everyone is in this parable. The sheep are surprised and the goats are surprised. Van Hurst, he's a pastor, he lives down in Texas and a younger guy, he's a four-year-old daughter, he's sitting in his living room one evening, he's reading a book while sitting on the floor, resting his back up against the couch, and his little four-year-old daughter comes into the room. She just wants some attention from Daddy, and as she walks in, she's holding a flavored chapstick in her hand, and she asks, do you want some, Daddy? Of course, he replied, and he promptly began to carefully spread that soft lip balm on his lips while he was sitting there reading his book. It was an extremely sour flavor. He couldn't really put his mind to it. But it felt good, so he put on another layer, kind of thick. Just then, uh, his wife, the little girl's mother, came in saying, Courtney, what did you do with my glue stick? <laughs> Surprise! That's the sort of picture that the last day that Jesus gives us a vision of the people are surprised. It's not what they expected. Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? When did we see you thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in? When did we see you needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? That's the surprise. That's the surprise. Here's the surprise. The sheep don't understand what they, they've done to, to experience such an honor. In a similar light, the goats don't understand why they're being guided towards the eternal fire. I can almost hear the complaints now, can't you? There are going to be lawsuits in heaven. Jesus, there must be some mistake. I'm not supposed to be in the left line. I'm supposed to be in the right line. And to this complaint, Jesus replies, I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was naked you gave me no clothing. I was sick and in prison and you ignored me. And the goats ask, when? They're surprised. When did we see you hungry? When did we see you thirsty? When did we see you naked, sick, or in prison? And Christ replies, when you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Surprise. It reminds me of an old story about a man who dies, finds himself standing in front of heaven's gate, and Peter apologetically explains that heaven has been using some of the IRS computer system and the hard drive failed. They don't have the emails. They don't even have any of the information about all the people on earth. Now Peter has to do personal interviews with each candidate to see if the person's fit to enter the kingdom of heaven. So Peter begins the questioning, what kind of deeds have you done that would make you worthy of heaven? And this man scratches his head, shrugs and answers, I don't know. Well, for example, were you ever part of the Boy Scouts and involved in some community projects to help people? No, I never did that. You ever helped an older person across the street? No, I never did that. Do you ever contribute some food to the food pantry or at least go over and help sort some food or something? Nah, never did that. Well, tell me, did you ever do anything good for anyone in your entire life? And the man thinks and finally says, well, you know, years and years ago, I, I went to church once and I, I put a nickel in the offering plate. Does that count? Peter's stumped. He doesn't know. He's got to get this clarified by Jesus. So he goes over to Jesus and he says, explains the whole story. He asks what to do. And Jesus says to Peter, it's simple. Give him back his nickel. 
Now pardon my crudeness, but we need to face the reality of this text. Jesus says that caring for the needy is serious business. Surprise! It's not about you. It's about how we love God and how we love one another. And that brings us to the second thing we need to note this morning. This parable is about faith and action. Some will want to say this parable, you know, is actually arguing for salvation by works. There are some who will dismiss this parable and say, you know, I don't have to listen to this parable because I don't believe in salvation by works. I believe in salvation by faith. So I don't have to worry. And as a good reformer, I believe the Bible teaches us that we are saved by faith, not by works. Genesis 15, 6, for instance, it says, Abram believed God. He had faith, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Faith is what saves. But what is faith? Is it just some mere intellectual assent? Or is it a participation in God's work in his world? I don't see this passage as saying that the sheep are sheep because of what they did. I understand this passage to say the sheep did what they did because they are sheep. The purpose behind the sheep's actions was not to earn brownie points so that they could stand before the heaven's gates and say, I deserve to get into heaven. I think they did what they did because they genuinely felt concern and compassion for the least of these. Simply put, they were compelled by the love of God to do what they did. It wasn't calculated. It was genuine and authentic love. Faith came first, and their actions were a natural consequence of God's spirit residing in them. E. Stanley Jones once told of a Brahmin convert who began to live at an ashram, which is a monastery over there in India, Stanley had founded it with some friends. The Brahmins, the upper caste, were drawn uh, to this ashram, and they converted to Christianity. Everyone in the ashram now was expected, no matter where they were in the caste hierarchy, to participate in community chores, including the cleaning of latrines. And at that task, that former Brahmin, of who I just spoke, from the upper class, he stopped short claiming that job was beneath him. And when Jones insisted that in Christ there is no unsuitable task and that all those who have been converted to the lordship of Jesus Christ should have no trouble cleaning latrines, the Indian responded, Brother Stanley, I'm converted, but not that far. And that's our problem, isn't it? We're converted, but not that far. We are supposed to be giving all to the Lord but we draw a line when something is more important to us than is the Lord. Compare that man's attitude with one of the nuns of Mother Teresa. One day Mother Teresa saw this nun just smiling, wide smile, full of joy. She asked the sister why she was so happy. And the nun explained that she had found an old man who was stuck in a drain. And the man had been stuck in that stinky muck of that drain for some time. He was completely covered with dirt and with maggots, and he stunk. The good sister cleaned the man up, took care of his open wounds. And as she was doing this, she told Mother Teresa, something beautiful happened. I knew I was touching the body of Christ. I knew I was touching the body of Christ. That's the real conversion. That's the kind of conversion that counts, that's genuine and authentic. You don't do something good because then God will have to let you into his kingdom. You do good because you are full, completely, with the love of God. You want to serve and obey God with all of your being. Surprise! One Sunday morning, Dr. William Quick was in his study, going over his sermon before worship at the Metropolitan Church up in Detroit. It's a Methodist church. When a layperson knocked on his door, I hate it when this happens. The gentleman apologized for the interruption, but he walked in and he handed Dr. Quick an envelope saying, read this after worship. Not right now, but after worship. Following worship that morning, Dr. Quick went back to his office, opened up the envelope, and found a note. This is what it, how it read. In the midst of this terrible recession which has hit Detroit, 
Large numbers of people are discouraged, out of work, hungry and cold. Many are surely finding their way to our church. During our morning devotions today, my wife Dorothy and I decided that no one in real need here in Detroit should be turned away. We don't want our pastor to be unable to help meet their needs, whether it be food, medicine, or whatever. Take the proceeds in this enclosed envelope and put it to work amongst the needy of Detroit. And on the substantial gift that was enclosed were the words written, to the glory of God for the work of Jesus Christ through his church. If Christ is to shine forth as the light of the world, that his disciples, you and me, must put our faith into action. No task is beneath us. Every person we serve is a child of God. And this brings us to the last thing I want to say this morning. We here at Desert Palms have a wonderful opportunity. Have you ever noticed how few truly satisfying experiences there are in life? If you ordered the television package from uh, Cox Cable, just the basic, you probably get about 60 television stations. If you got the top tier, you've got well over 300. And you sit there on your couch and you flip through the station and you say, there's nothing to watch. Not satisfying. Oh, or we chase a little white ball around the golf course for four hours. But there's always this little nagging doubt in the back of our mind while whether or not we're really having that much fun. Is this really satisfying? We buy a new car. Oh, it gives us a great feeling at the beginning, but soon it's just another piece of machinery that needs some attention. Is it really satisfying? Let me suggest that you try something that never gets old, that never gets stale, that's never unsatisfying. Do something for someone truly in need, one of the least of these. Do you know why I think the members of Desert Palms are satisfied? Because we are constantly looking to help those in need. I have provided in the bulletin this morning on the insert the giving of our church up to this point of the year. $95,000. In fact, that number's low already because in the last couple of days it's gone up to 98. But we don't just give money. We give ourselves. People building homes for Habitat for Humanity, people working with women at Homeward Bound, people serving at food pantries, pancake breakfasts, fairs with a flare, turkey collections, student scholarships, student uniforms, list goes on and on. People praying for one another. People visiting people when they are sick. People here at Desert Palms love people. That's satisfying. Let me tell you about a man named Floyd. According to the standards of the world, Floyd was a nobody. He was definitely one of the least of these. Floyd traveled around the country looking for work, especially at harvest time. Floyd had no home. He had no place to go. A Christian couple invited him into their home one night and gave him a home-cooked dinner and said, you know, we got some work out in the, uh, our cherry orchard that you could do tomorrow. He said, great. So he sat down to eat. He didn't say very much over the meal. The wife, Nancy, offered to uh, wash his clothes, but he declined. And then she said, well, here's the guest bedroom. He said, no, I'll sleep under one of the trees out in the orchard tonight. Next day, he picked cher cherries off of the trees in the orchard next to their home. He slept under the tree again the next night. Those trees gave him his livelihood. Early the next morning, Floyd returned to the couple who had shown him such kindness, and when he finished, he said, I have one last project to finish in the orchard, and then I'm leaving. So Nancy, she ran back into the kitchen, and on an impulse, she got out some paper and wrote him a letter telling him of God's love. She stuck it with a little cash into a New Testament. She found his backpack that was in the yard and stuck it in this packet into his backpack. She imagined him traveling that day looking for work and at the end of the day bedding down somewhere under the stars, weary and all alone. And she was worn by the thought of Floyd's surprise when he discovered her note, the New Testament, and the cash that she had planted in his backpack. Never found out how he responded because they never saw Floyd ever again. But four years later, they received in the mail a letter from Floyd's sister telling them of his death. And it seems that what had happened was that Floyd's sister was going through his few belongings when she found the New Testament in the letter that Nancy had wrote telling of God's love. And Floyd's sister in her letter wrote, and I quote, the New Testament Bible in your letter 
must have been very dear to his heart, for he carried them with him until he died. Such a simple gesture. A note, a Bible, a little cash. But little counts for a lot in the kingdom of God. I don't know about you, but I want to be surprised at finding myself among the sheep on that day of judgment. And more importantly in this life, I want to possess a faith that's real, that's genuine, that's authentic. I want to take advantage of one of the most joyous and satisfying opportunities that Christ gives all of us to minister to one another, especially the least of these, in his name. Amen.